I'm going to be reading Helen Keller, <clears throat> Chapter 3. Helen Keller, The Story of My Life, Chapter 3. Um, if you uh, like, the best thing to do if you're trying to learn to read is to follow along with me, or you could listen along. Um, but if you follow along, I know that I read at a quick pace. However, um, it's in your best interest to try to keep up, and then that will only improve your reading as well. Okay, chapter 3. Meanwhile, the desire to express myself grew. A few signs I used became less and less adequate, and my failures to make myself understood were invariably followed by outbursts of passion. I felt as if invisible hands were holding me, and I made frantic efforts to free myself. I struggled, not that struggling helped matters, but the spirit of resistance was strong within me. I generally broke down in tears and physical exhaustion. If my mother happened to be near, I crept into her arms, too miserable even to remember the cause of the tempest. After a while, the need of some means of communication became so urgent that these outbursts occurred daily, sometimes hourly. My parents were deeply grieved and perplexed. We lived a long way from any school for the blind or the deaf, and it seemed unlikely that anyone would come to such an out-of-the-way place as Tuskumbuyi to teach a child who was both deaf and blind. Indeed, my friends and relatives sometimes doubted whether I could be taught. My mother's only way of hope came from Dickens' American Notes. She had read his account of Laura Brigman and remembered vaguely that she was deaf and blind, yet had been educated. But she also remembered with a hopeless pang that Dr. Ho, who had discovered the way to teach the deaf and blind, had been dead for many years. His methods probably died with him, and they had not, how was a little... And and if, if they had not, how was a little girl in a far-off town in Alabama to receive the benefits of them? When I was about six years old, my father heard of an eminent oculist in Baltimore who had been successful in many cases that had seemed hopeless. My parents at once determined to take me to Baltimore to see if anything could be done for my eyes. The journey, which I remember well, was very pleasant. I made friends with many people on the train. My lady gave, one lady gave me a box of shells. My father made holes in these so that I could string them, and for a long time they kept me happy and contented. The conductor, too, was kind. Often, when he went to his rounds, I clung to his coattails while he collected and punched the tickets. His punch, with which he let me play, was a delightful toy. Curled up in a corner of the seat, I amused myself for hours making funny little holes in bits of cardboard. My aunt made me a big doll out of towels. It was the most comical, shapeless thing. This improvised doll with no nose, mouth, ears, or eyes. Nothing that even the imagination of a child can convert into a face. Curiously enough, the absence of eyes struck me more than all the other defects put together. I pointed this out to everybody with provoking persistency, but no one seemed equal to the task of providing the doll with eyes. A bright idea, however, shot into my mind, and the problem was solved. I tumbled off the seat and searched it until I found my aunt's cape, which was trimmed with large beads. I pulled two beads off and indicated to her that I wanted her to sew them on the doll. She raised my hand to her eyes in a questioning way, and I nodded energetically. The beads were sewed in the right place, and I could not contain myself for joy, but immediately I lost all interest in the doll. During the whole trip, I did not have one fit of temper. There were so many things to keep my mind and fingers busy. When we arrived in Baltimore, Dr. Chisholm received us kindly, but he could do nothing, he said, however, that, that I could be educated, and advised my father cons to consult Dr. Alexander Graham Bell of Washington, who would be able to give him information about schools and teachers of deaf or blind children. So Dr. Gra Alexander Graham Bell is one of the most leading intellectuals of, and inventors of the time. Acting on the doctor's advice, we went immediately to Washington to see Dr. Bell. My father, with a sad heart and many misgivings, I wholly unconscious of his anguish, finding pleasure in the excitement of moving from place to place. Child as I was, I once felt the tenderness and sympathy which endeared Dr. Bell to so many hearts, as his wonderful achievement, achievements enlist their admiration. He held me on his knee while I examined his watch, and he made it strike for me. He understood my signs, and I knew it and loved him at once. But I did not dream that the interview would be the door through which I should pass from darkness into light, from isolation to friendship, companionship, knowledge, love. Dr. Bell advised my father to write to Mr. Agnos, director of the Perkins Institute in Boston. 
had seen of Dr. Howell's great labors for the blind, and asked him if he had a teacher competent to begin my education. This my father did at once, and in a few weeks there came a kind of letter from Mr. Agnes with the comforting assurance that a teacher had been found. This was in the summer of 1886, but Mrs. Sullivan did not arrive until the following March. Thus I came up out of Egypt and stood before Sinai, and a power divine touched my spirit and gave it life, so that I beheld many wonders. And from the sacred mountain I heard a voice which said, Knowledge is love and light and vision. That's very moving, huh? That was chapter 3 of Helen Keller, The Story of My Life. Um, I really enjoy them, that she describes how she's going down the train, and despite not being able to hear or see, she makes friends with the train, uh, with different people on the train, and she has all these different memories from the train. She uh, uses the hole puncher and makes uh, holes and pieces of paper. She, uh, you know, uh, what are some other things? She, uh, uh, Her aunt makes a doll, and she complains that the doll doesn't have any eyes. And she can't even use her eyes, so, um, you know, she has somebody put the doll, uh, eyes on the doll. Um, it's, it's a very interesting, and then uh, she meets uh, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, the famous inventor, um, at the end of the uh, chapter. So, you know, it's a very interesting chapter. Um, you're welcome. This is a fa famous book, Helen Keller, The Story of My Life. Um, if you're trying to read or if you'd like to uh, improve your reading, it would be a great idea for you to uh, uh, read along with this. Um, you can find it on your computer and just try to follow along as I'm reading. Um, it will consciously and subconsciously improve your reading. And um, if you're just watching this, you may dislike me and just wanted to hate on me, and you might be watching it because of that. So I hope you enjoyed the chapter. Uh, it's a short chapter of uh, one of the best autobiographies. I'm really enjoying this. And, uh, hope you are too.